Good evening. For a smaller crowd, it was the singing was amazing. Thank you, Alan. Thank you, Michaela. Picking good songs. What is a good definition for chaos? <laughs> okay, someone went. It's a good one. It's a good definition. Anybody that follows Hank. Anybody that follows Hank. Yes. What you would see in a container holding uncompressed gas? All right, that's a little technical. The opposite of order. Okay, the opposite of order. Uh huh. The opposite of order. Okay, one more. Yes, Hannah. <laughs> a teenager's room or a what? Okay, a teenager's room or a chart graphing a teenage girl's emotions. She said girl, she's a girl, she can say that. I wouldn't have said that. <laughs> Cosmos is the idea of order. We refer to our, our universe as a cosmos. It is that the universe is seen as well ordered, that there is balance, that there's form, that there's function. And we can choose the sort of life we want to live using these two ideas, chaos or cosmos. I thought it was interesting in our class, Bible class this morning, Kenny was talking about peacemakers, and he said, doesn't everyone want peace in their lives? And someone said, no, it seems like some people thrive on, on chaos. Kind of like the life of the person that we talked about this morning, where their lives are just constantly going in a circle. They're not moving forward. They're just going nowhere, and there's a lot of chaos, and they repeat the things that they've done wrong, and they continue to do those over and over again. If you watched somebody's life on a video and you kept seeing these problems and over and over and over, you would think they kind of thrive on chaos. We live at a time when there's a lot of chaos. But I don't think it's unique to the human experience. I think any time a society doesn't understand the lordship of Christ in their life, there's going to be chaos. Abraham Lincoln was an individual who experienced times of serious depression. Some people said this was because he had this melancholy, sort of moody, type of temperament and things because he was a deep thinker and he was very introspective things going on around him caused him to uh, to, to be depressed he, he took these things very seriously and he took these things to heart I can't imagine what life in the 1860s was like. We may, have, we may think, well, it was earlier times, simpler, things not as complicated, but they had some pretty serious social problems in their time. And, and they were dealing with the issue of slavery. And you had some people who wanted to deal with it and other people who, who said and did unspeakable things. And, and you have these two forces going at each other, trying to prove that they're the ones that are on the right side. And in the end, 
because of Abraham Lincoln's steadfastness. Evil began to be dealt with. In Isaiah 41, we deal with a similar type of situation. And as you're turning to that, I want to remind you, that's why I say we are definitely in a time of chaos in our world today. And it's not unique to the human situation. It is... It is because humans turn away from God or they don't recognize the authority of God in their lives. And in Isaiah 41, there is this description of really the end of a time of chaos for God's people, Israel. But it hasn't happened yet. It's just a prediction of what is going to happen. Isaiah is writing and dealing with something that's going to happen in the future, and at the point of where Israel is, they cannot comprehend, one, some of the things that are happening to them, two, the reality of exile, of lo- losing everything that they had, their life, their, their livelihoods, everything that was familiar to them, they lost all of that. And then being restored moving from rebellion to chaos to cosmos in their lives. Isaiah 41, first couple of verses, introduces us to what's being discussed here. The prophet says, Be silent before me, islands, and let peoples renew their strength. Let them approach then, let them testify, Let us come together for the trial. Who has stirred him up from the east? He calls righteousness to his feet. The Lord hands over to him nations. He subdues kings. He makes them like dust with his sword, like wind-driven stubble with his bow. He pursues them, going on safely, hardly touching the path with his feet. Who has performed and done this? calling the generations from the beginning. I, Yahweh, am the first, and with the last, I am he. The islands see and are afraid. The whole earth trembles. They approach and arrive. Each one helps the other and says to one another, take courage. And I want to stop there because this is the description of of the solution to the chaos that they are facing. And it's coming from an unlikely place. Israel is to be conquered by Babylon. And though Babylon was an instrument of God's wrath, Babylon abused and misused. And we read about Nebuchadnezzar and how he was, became prideful because he felt like he was the king of the world. And God humbled him. But before that, a lot of abuse was was given to God's people and they had to experience this oppression in addition to being taken into exile. And and Babylon is, is a mighty, mighty empire. And it's hard for them to conceive that something else or somebody else is going to come in and take care of this problem to help them move from exile back to their house, to move from chaos to cosmos. This is a reference to Cyrus the Great. Wait a minute. Cyrus the Great, he is... Uh, one of the first great, great rulers of the Persian Empire. And uh, through uh, the history and the power that this empire amassed, they were able to conquer, and I have these in the wrong order, but they were able to conquer this, this region from the Indus River to the Aegean Sea. Uh, and in North Africa, uh, the Persian Empire spread out. 
And so they were very powerful, and they began to sweep over and conquer the land that the Babylonians once ruled. Cyrus the Great was, was a very great ruler, and probably in regards to, uh, we might uh, refer to Alexander as Alexander the Great, but probably Cyrus was, was genuinely uh, a great ruler with his innovation, with his abilities uh, in, in military conquest, uh, with the way he ruled his people. He was great. He was significant. And so this is the solution to God's people's problems. It was from an unlikely source, an unlikely place, coming to to end their exile. The last part, verse 6, mentions uh, this, these are, that refers to the wording of the, the people who are the Babylonians. They realize that this threat is coming from Cyrus the Great and the Persian army. And and so they try to encourage each other, and they began to call on their God to save them and to act on their behalf. And and that's that's the way that normal people that people who don't know God, that's how they take care of their problems. They call on things, and as we're going to read uh, verse 7, they call on things, they trust in things, they depend on things that can't help them. Verse 7, the craftsman encourages the metal worker who flattens the one with the hammer, supports the one who strikes the anvil, saying of the soldering, it is good, He fastens it with nails so it will not fall over. Verse 7 is a description of the way people of the world solve their problems. With things that really don't help. With ideas and programs and, and solutions that only, in reality, make the problem worse. And in the end, won't save them. Isaiah 41 gives us five ways that we can cope with chaos and move to cosmos. And the first is found in that statement that we just read. That's really a funny statement. I know none of you guys busted a gut when I read verse 7, but it's really a funny statement. There's an irony, and that's why it reflects the inability of the solutions of man to solve our problems. They trust in this God. And how powerful is this God? Well, in their minds, he's great. But what do they have? How does the God stand up? They have to nail it to the floor. That's funny. I wonder how they would make that into a joke if it was... Uh, last comic standing Persian style. And they would be making fun of the Babylonians and they think they have gods. Cyrus was a great leader. At this point, Babylonia had nobody to match, but they had their gods that they had to nail down. Uh, so I wonder how they would have made that into a joke. But it really is. It's a funny statement. It's funny in an ironic sort of way. But think about the solutions that you go to when you have problems, when your life is chaotic. Abraham Lincoln, one of the things that he did as he struggled with his depression is he was a very funny person. And he would see humor in things that were around him. And, and he, would, he would value humor as a way to relieve the tension and to refocus everybody on the things that are at hand. So Lincoln told a lot of funny stories and he made a lot of jokes that seemed to bring relief. Lincoln himself said, if it were not for these stories, jokes, jests, I should die. They give vent. Uh, They are the vents of my mood and my gloom. Uh, He said to one of his staff people, 
um, was, wanted to come into his, his, his office, he said, come in here and tell me what you know. It won't take long. I think about humor practically in the lives of, of God's people. We should always be willing to not make fun of people, finding humor there, but find the things that are funny in life and try and bring those out. In my family, growing up when I was a kid, there was very little laughter, very little humor. Um, and if, though we were a sarcastic bunch, we didn't even know how to use sarcasm very well. So our, chas- our sarcasm oftentimes were insults. And that's not funny. Lenita was raised in a home where there was laughter, there was humor, and they looked for the funny things in life. And, you know, if you stop and think about it, if you could watch a video of your life, you probably do a lot of really funny things. And to be able to, in good humor, point those out in, in jest and, and, and just laugh. Our home, because of Lenita's sense of humor has always been a place of laughter, and it's been a refuge. Um, Life is tough. Life is tough for all of us in in different ways. And if the home isn't that place of refuge, then where is that place of refuge? Where is that place of humor? So that's the first way to cope with the chaos. Secondly, is finding joy. Finding joy. As we read on in verses 8 through 16 of our passage, you see God seeking to encourage his people and helping them to understand that uh, the Babylonian Empire is great, but it's not greater than me. Cyrus the Great is a great ruler, but he's not greater than me. Verse 8 says, but you, Israel, my servant, Jacob, whom I have chosen, descendant of Abraham, my friend, I brought you from the ends of the earth and called you from its farthest corners. Listen to the language that he uses to express his love and his, his, the depth of his concern for his people. Even though they've been rebellious, even though they've been through a great challenge, he still has this affection for them. Do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be afraid, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will hold on to you with my righteous hand. Be sure that all who are enraged against you will be ashamed and disgraced. Those who contend with you will become as nothing and will perish. You will look at those who contend with you, but you will not find them. Those who war against you will become absolutely nothing. For I, Yahweh, your God, hold your right hand and say to you, Do not fear, I will help you. Do not fear, you worm, Jacob. Um, sometimes, uh, I don't know, is it in a, a new song, the new song book that, uh, Oh, what a worm is I, one of the songs uh, at, the, at the cross, at the cross where I first saw the light, there's that. I always hated that reference, calling us worms. I I, didn't, I don't like that. I'm not a worm. But sometimes we, we feel like that because of the things going on in our lives. If you read in the book of Lamentations, Israel knew that they were guilty and that it was because of their actions and their sinfulness and their rebellion that they lost everything they had. And so they probably felt pretty low about their situation. I think that's what that reference to worm. He says, do not fear, you worm Jacob, you men of Israel. I will help you. This is the Lord's declaration. Your Redeemer Redeemer is the Holy One of Israel. See, I will make you into a sharp threshing board, new with many teeth. You will thresh mountains and pulverize them and make the hills into chaff. You will winnow them and and a wind will carry them away. A gate will scatter them. But you will rejoice in the Lord. You will boast in the Holy One of Israel. Eight verses packed with encouragement, packed with reminders that God still loves us. 
And in our challenges and in our rebellion, God still loves us. And in our chaos, not only does he love us, he will help us to make that transition from chaos to cosmos, from, from crazy to calm, from disorder to order. And that instills us with a deep sense of, of joy, of confidence knowing that, that he's there to help us. And he's, he's proven his ability to help us and to carry us. Abraham Lincoln often found a place of solace in, in learning. Uh, the things that he used to distract him from his depression, he loved Shakespeare, he loved Poetry, And even though he had very little formal education, uh, he would walk miles to borrow a book that he would read and that would just help him to connect with himself emotionally, help him to communicate the emotions of his heart because of the situations in his life, because of the circumstances of his day. He found joy in the things that helped him and sustained him. And, and that's for God's people as well. We find joy knowing that God sustains us, knowing that no one will oppose us. And those who, will, who do oppose us will come to nothing because he will help us. The third way to cope with chaos is cultivate faith in humility. Verses 17 through 20. Say, the poor and the needy seek water, but there is none. Their tongues are parched with thirst. I, Yahweh, will answer them. I, the God of Israel, will not forsake them. I will open rivers on the barren heights and springs in the middle of the plains. I will turn the desert into a pool of water and dry lands into, a, into springs of water. I will plant cedars in the desert, acacias, myrtles, and olive trees. I will put juniper trees in the desert, elms and cypress trees together, so that my people see and know Consider and understand that the hand of the Lord has done this. The Holy One of Israel has created it. What Isaiah is trying to teach us there is that, that God will do amazing things. And sometimes when we see things happen, sometimes when, when God acts on our behalf, we don't notice it. We don't pay attention to it. We say, oh, what a coincidence. Or, whoa, that was good luck, wasn't it? And no, it is God acting on our behalf. And he wants to act on our behalf. He wants to enter into the chaos of our life and bring that cosmos. To bring that order. And when he does that, recognize it for what it is and respond in faith and humility. And I really thought using the word faith and humility are really using the same two words. They almost define each other. Humility is the ability to know that it's not because of you, because of your good luck, because of your uh, brilliant mind and all of the things that you think you're able to accomplish. Humility is recognizing that God is the one who is doing these things. And he does amazing things. He can turn a desert into an oasis. He can plant trees that don't grow in the desert. In the desert. What can he do with your life? What can he do with the chaos that's going on in your world? A lot. Abraham Lincoln oftentimes would, uh, would witness things. And uh, in their day, they called it the providence of God. And, and he would just be amazed. Uh, the, the stories of the battles in the Civil War are just filled with, how, uh, filled with the interpretation of what was happening by the people of their time as the hand of God. And... And he says, I have been driven many times upon my knees by the overwhelming conviction that I had nowhere else to go. And at those times, I saw the hand of God. For my own wisdom 
and that of and that of all about me seemed insufficient for the day. He realized that in and of himself he could accomplish very little. But through his his life of devotion and and the things that happening around him, not turning him to himself, but turning into faith, he was able to make it through. Verses 21 through 24 help us to put our fears into perspective. Verse 21 says, Submit your case, says the Lord. Present your arguments, says Jacob's king. Let them come and tell us what will happen. Tell us the past events so that we may reflect on them and know the outcome or tell us the future. Tell us the coming events. Then we will know that you are God's little g. Indeed, do something good or bad. Then we will be in awe and perceive. Look, you are nothing and your work is worthless. Anyone who chooses you is detestable. When I read statements like that in the Bible, it gives me courage. Because God, all of this stuff isn't, it hasn't happened yet. All of this stuff is, is, or most of it is yet to come. But God's calling it. God's calling it in advance. He's saying, this is going to happen. I'm going to raise a power from the east. And he's going to free my people. And so for us, from where we are today, in 2016, we know all these things have already happened. These things have already taken place. God has done it. And so he challenges those who believe in themselves, those who believe in the gods of this world. He challenges them. He says, okay, tell us what's going to happen. We'll give you, we'll, we'll let you tell us from the past. We'll, we'll give you an easy one there. Tell us what has happened. Or tell us what's going to happen in the future. And the point is they can't. They're nothing. The things that we fear, you know, and society tells us, oh, this is going to happen, and so we have to do this, and that's going to happen, so we have to do that. We make a lot of plans for things that never happen. Why? Because without the Spirit of God, without the mind of God, human beings have no idea what is going to happen. And we have to be careful of where we put our trust. That last statement, those who trust in the powers of this world, in his mind, that's a harsh word he says there. He says they're detestable. Those who trust in the things of this world are detestable. And the whole point is we have to keep our fears into perspective. There is nothing that God can't handle. There is nothing that God can't accomplish. He called it, it happened, and he's given us some perspective for the future. He's told us what's going to happen in the future. We need to be ready and not be surprised. And finally, our final way to cope with chaos is to find our purpose or to carry out our purpose. The last part of it, starting in verse 25. I have raised up one from the north, and he has come. One from the east who invokes my name, he will march over rulers as if they were mud, like a potter who treads the clay, who told about this from the beginning, so that we might know, and from times past, so that we might say, he is, he is right? No one announced it, no one told about it, no one heard your words. I was the first to say to Zion, look, here they are. 
and gave a herald of good news to Jerusalem. When I look, there is no one. There is no counselor among them. When I ask them, they have nothing to say. Look, all of them are a delusion. Their works are non-existent. Their images are wind and emptiness. So, you people stay focused on what you're supposed to do. Do not fear what they're trying to tell you. Do not believe where they're trying to lead you. Don't listen to them. He's telling his people to prepare because this is going to happen. And don't stand around. Don't wait because it's going to happen. He tells uh, the exiles, when you're in the land, uh, have children and raise your families in the teaching and instruction of the Lord. Keep doing all those things that you did when you weren't in exile. Keep doing all those things when, that you did when you were at home because I'm going to pull this all together and you're going to see and you're going to be amazed. Don't lose track of your purpose. That's what they say was the strength in the life of Abraham Lincoln. That, that part of his depression was because of what was going on in the world around him. And, and as, he, as he would second guess his decisions, as he would mourn the loss of so many lives for the purpose that was a higher cause than him, he would become even more depressed and even more discouraged in his advisors would also become discouraged. And they would want to give up. And to one of his advisors, Quentin Campbell, he says, adhere to your purpose, and you will soon feel as well as you ever did. Lincoln's goal to end slavery and to preserve the Union would eventually become his central goal and purpose. And he defeated all of his enemies, the enemies outside and the enemies inside, by staying focused on his purpose. And I, th I think that speaks to us today. I think when we start worrying about the things going on around us, uh, in, in some cases it's deceivers and liars, in other cases it's, it's, it's uh, misdirected people with good intentions, but in a lot of cases it's the enemy. And, and we can become discouraged and second-guess ourselves and lose our purpose. Forget what we're all about, what we're supposed to be doing, why we're here in the first place. A, a person, a people with purpose, are a people that cannot be stopped. God acts, God's acts are undeniable. And these, these five ways will help us to, to not only bring order to our lives, but maintain order in our lives. And it's a, it's, a, it's a matter of putting these all together. But our motivation isn't simply because we know these things. Our motivation comes from the fact that God act, God's acts, God's actions are undeniable and will be undeniable. And I encourage you as we sing this song together to look for his hand in the things that are going on around us. Let us stand and sing.